Good afternoon. I'm Jim Townsend, and I'm the director of the Carl Levin Center for Oversight and Democracy. It is my pleasure to welcome you to today's panel discussion entitled Pursuing Factual Consensus, the Role of Congress. Thank you for joining us. Today's discussion will be moderated by my colleague, Elise Bean, who is co-director of the Levin Center's Washington office. Elise is a 30-year veteran of the Hill and a leading national expert on congressional oversight. Before I turn things over to Elise, I wanna offer some context for today's panel and how it relates to the mission of the Levin Center. Today's panel is the second of a series of discussions the Levin Center is holding this year to explore how facts become established in the public mind and the role various institutions, including legislatures and the media, play in uncovering facts and influencing the public to embrace them as true. It is no secret that America's public square is in a crisis. The public's ability to separate fact from fiction and to defend itself from lies has declined dramatically under a relentless campaign of mis- and disinformation, often from public officials and their media enablers who are swamping the public with so many falsehoods that people don't know what is true. Today, we are going to talk with three veterans of the United States Senate who distinguish themselves as leaders of legislative fact-finding and in-depth oversight. They did this by working across the aisle to uphold the Senate's responsibility to enhance the public's understanding of key issues. We are thrilled to have them with us today to unpack how in-depth bipartisan oversight works, when it works and when it is difficult to achieve, and the role it plays, or perhaps the role it should play in promoting a fact-based public square in our country. Bipartisan legislative fact-finding as practiced by our panelists and by the late Senator Carl Levin, the namesake of the center, and as we promote it here at the Levin Center, <clears throat> offers a template for how people of different backgrounds and beliefs can collaborate to pursue factual consensus and build mutual empathy and respect. Hopefully we can discuss not only how our panelists did this, but explore how we can elevate these norms in Congress and across the country. So for more information about the Levin Center and uh, how we are promoting these values, I'd encourage you to visit our website, levin-center.org. With that, let me again thank all of you in attendance and our esteemed panelists, and I'll turn things over to Elise. Need to unmute. Thank you, Jim. I'm excited to introduce our panelists and get a dialogue going. We also invite the audience to submit written questions to the uh, Q&A function. We'll be checking uh, those questions along the way and work to include them in our discussion. So let's get started. Today's panelists have a wealth of knowledge and personal experience conducting oversight investigations. First is Bill Cohen, a Republican from Maine who served in both the House and the Senate and participated in important oversight investigations in both places. For example, in the House, he served on the Ju Judiciary Committee and delved deeply into the Watergate investigation. In the Senate, he served on the Select Committee that investigated the Iran-Contra affair. He also participated in several seminal bipartisan investigations when serving with Senator Levin on the Subcommittee on Oversight of Government Management. They included inquiries into WedTech, a company that used political pull to win large defense contracts, outrageous backlogs in the social security disability program that forced disabled Americans to wait years for benefits they deserved. They also looked at defense contracts that were issued without competition and resulted in inflated prices, including toilet seats that cost $640 a piece. Senator Levin also served, served on the Senate Armed Services Committee and the Intelligence Committee participating in multiple oversight efforts. After he left the Senate, he found out how it felt to be on the other side of a congressional inquiry when he became the Secretary of Defense for four years under President Clinton. Next is Claire McCaskill, a Democrat from Missouri who served two terms as a US Senator from 2007 to 2019. Before that, she'd served as the Missouri State Auditor a position on the state level that also calls for oversight work. While in the Senate, she served on the Armed Services, Finance, 
and Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs Committees, including as a member and later chair of the Senate's premier investigative body, the Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations, or as we call it, PSI. One key PSI investigation she helped lead along with Senator Rob Portman was a two-year bipartisan battle against Backpage.com, a company suspected of sex trafficking on the internet, including victimizing underage girls. PSI subpoenaed the company documents, went to court to enforce the subpoena, and won a court order compelling Backpage to turn over the documents. They helped prove the company's misconduct and led to a prison sentence for the CEO. Senator McCaskill also chaired a subcommittee on contracting oversight, which he used to expose problems with numerous high-priced federal contracts. They included $11 billion in annual service contracts to provide school lunches across the country, $3 billion in DOD and State Department contracts to help Latin American governments battle drug lords, contracts to build facilities in Afghanistan, and even a contract to service Arlington National Cemetery. She did fantastic work with that contract oversight. Finally, we will learn from Norm Coleman, a Republican from Minnesota, who served in the Senate for six years from 2003 to 2009. Before that, he served as mayor of St. Paul, a position which called for a lot of oversight efforts on the local level. While in the Senate, he served on the Foreign Relations, Agriculture, and Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs Committees. And he worked with Senator Levin on PSI, where they traded leadership spots as chair and ranking minority member over the years. The two of them worked on a number of impressive bipartisan investigations. The oversight inquiries led by Senator Coleman included deep dives into UN programs, including corruption and misuse of the UN oil for food program. An examination of the national security vulnerabilities arising from shipping containers that entered the United States without adequate inspections. He also exposed abusive credit uh, counseling firms that exploited persons and families struggling with debt. One of my favorites was his year long series of hearings examining federal contractors who were paid with taxpayer dollars, but then failed to pay their own taxes. He also looked at internet pharmacies that sold counterfeit or unsafe medications and Medicare claims that used the names of dead doctors and much more. In addition, Senator Coleman was an active partner in investigations led by Senator Levin, including oversight of accounting firms that mass marketed abusive tax shelters and money laundering and tax evasion schemes that utilized offshore jurisdictions and financial institutions like UBS and Riggs Bank. So there you have it, three amazing champions of congressional oversight who can offer us wise counsel on not only how they were able to do their work, but how to elevate those same oversight norms in Congress today when it comes to fact-finding. All right, let's get started. I'd like to start off by giving each of you a few minutes to describe an experience you had while in Congress involving fact-finding. Specifically, please tell us about a time when you saw Congress through a committee or otherwise reach a decision about an important question of fact, what impact that conclusion had and whether and how Congress then affected the public's perception of what is true. So Senator Cohen, let's start off with you. Okay. Well, Elise, I think uh, you took my opening lines here by making reference to uh, the Watergate Committee. Uh, I uh, was able to get on the Watergate uh, Committee, actually it was the House Judiciary Committee, uh, at the recommendation of uh, a young man who said, when you go to Washington, make sure that you put the committees you wanna be on put them last and not first. I thought that was totally counterintuitive, but I put the Judiciary Committee last and I was told it doesn't do anything. Well, it turned out it did do something uh, shortly after I joined the committee. And our, our purpose was uh, following the quote, Saturday night massacre when Elliot Richardson, the Attorney General resigned, et cetera, uh, that um, the investigation into impeachable offenses began. And I was lucky to have served on a committee that was chaired by Peter Rodino. Um, Peter Rodino was a, uh, a, um, a, a Democrat from New Jersey who conducted himself with total fairness uh, throughout the committee and treated Republicans with equal time, equal opportunity to pursue the facts. 
And the first thing we had to do, which was not a fact, is decide what an impeachable offense was. And then once we had in our own minds what it was, then take evidence to determine what the facts were that would lead up to impeachable offenses. And so I learned at a very early stage of my career to work with Democrats as well as Republicans to try and determine what are the facts that we then had to apply to the law. And during that entire experience, uh, I, uh, I think we came to the right conclusion uh, and we did so in a way before the public that I think at least satisfied the majority of the people that we had acted according to our duties and oath of office. Watergate is still known as an amazing bipartisan investigation. So thank you for that example. Uh, Senator McCaskill. Thank you. It is uh, terrific to be here. And I wanna um, probably start with a word and end with a word today, and that is staff. Uh, I think it's something that's way overlooked by those of us that are fortunate enough to ever have the word Senator in front of our names. Uh, it is just the nature of the beast that we want credit, but I think all good oversight begins and ends with hiring staff that cares about it and that is smarter than you are and isn't afraid to tell you that. My experience with that, that I wanted to talk about in the beginning of this um, time is uh, more contracting. I was motivated by this because I am a Harry Truman fangirl and I realized what impact the Truman Committee had on this country. And I was watching from the sidelines all the waste that was going on in Iraq. Uh, the, the, the dominance of contractors in modern warfare and the impact it was having on the costs of warfare and our ability to get what we needed to soldiers. So when I came to Washington and got on the Armed Services Committee with the blessing of Carl Levin, I began working very hard along with Jim Webb to try to do something more than a one-off, but rather reform the whole way contracting occurred in the military. That involved trips to Iraq uh, with staff to not talk about the dog and pony show and PowerPoint presentations we all got when we went to Iraq. I wanted to ask questions about contracting. I wanted to ask questions about contracting representatives. And it really culminated with a bipartisan effort because unfortunately, a lot of my Republican colleagues believe this was about Bush bashing, that this was about going after the Republicans because of the war in Iraq. I had to convince John Warner of my sincerity. I had to develop a relationship with him and let him see that I was in the weeds and that I understood the problem and that I knew there was a better solution. And finally, I won John Warner over. And when I did, we got the War Contracting Commission. We stood up a whole division on contracting in the military. And I'll finish with the culmination, the most successful thing that ever happened to me in the Senate. About five years after I began this journey, a staff member came in and said, I got a call from a citizen, somebody who worked at CRS that had gone over in a volunteer position in a civilian role in Iraq. She had come back and had called my staff member and said, I think your boss would want to hear this story. I was in a meeting outside of Kabul and there was a bunch of military folks in the room and they were talking about buying something. And one of them said, I think we can get away with not bidding this. And somebody else in the room said, no, you won't. McCaskill will find it. And that's all about staff. Wow, what a great story. Uh, Senator Coleman. Thank you. And by the way, let me start by associating myself with the comments from the senator from Missouri at regard to staff, because in the end, uh, the audience out there, folks under 35 may run Washington. Uh, they work hard. Uh, they're not, not, these are not nine to five, five day a week jobs. They're really out there. And, you know, any success we have is because we're surrounded by all the talent. You know, and first of all, let me also start by saying thank you to the Levin Center. Thank you for, for, for kind of uh, proper continuing the legacy of Carl Levin. I had the great pleasure of working with Senator Levin. I was chair of the permanent subcommittee for four years and then ranking member for two years. Uh, and, and I learned a lot from him, uh, both as chair and, and as ranking member. Uh, and his legacy is an important legacy and legacy of, of, of being able to work in a bipartisan fashion, actually solve people's problems. We're obviously not seeing a lot of that in Washington today. It's challenging. So I really want to say thank you to Levin Center for holding this forum, for allowing me to be part of it. Yeah, I, I could talk about, you know, big picture. We did oil for food. We, we, we did investigation of how North Korea was using the U.S. UNDP program as, as a money laundering scheme, literally money laundering. Uh, and, and, you know, I took great pride when, when the 
new Secretary General of the United Nations about to renew, Ban Ki-moon, was going to be appointed. He actually wanted to meet with me to talk to me about, about what was happening in the UN and how they were approaching reform, et cetera. But Lisa, let me, let me go small on, on this. And that is, uh, we did an investigation, you mentioned about credit card counseling uh, and, and about you know, people being ripped off. Uh, these are people, uh, citizens, Americans who are in distress. Okay, they're in trouble. These are working families in trouble and getting ripped to an industry that was taking advantage of them. And there was some, there was some real bad apples there. And, and in the end, we were able to, to I, I think, help people. And, and I have to say, and I think my colleagues would say the same thing. When I walk the streets, now someone comes up to me, they very rarely thank me for voting for Senate file so-and-so. They thank me for helping their dad or their mom or their brother, or some personal thing that you did. And, and that invest, you know, that invest, and, and, and one of the things I think we're gonna to get to this point a lot, at least when I was working with Carl, we didn't argue over the facts. We, we, we argued over the solution. Okay? We had different approaches. Uh, I'm a, a conservative Republican. He's a liberal Democrat. Uh, we, 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 we had the same baseline, which was important and which we have trouble getting to today. The, the debate was over the resolution. How do we, but we both wanted the same end. We both wanted the best outcome for our constituents, but we, we disagreed quite often on how we got there. Uh, and, and I kind of wish we were in that place today. Let's agree on, on what the issue is, what the problems are, and then let's have a spirited debate about the solutions. Thank you. Three really revealing discussions of fact finding. And in fact, you've all had this personal experience of working on a congressional investigation into complicated issues, often where the two parties have a different perspective, different interests. A key purpose of the congressional oversight investigation is to find the facts for the benefit of the public and possible legislation. So I wanna ask you, how important is Congress's role in fact-finding? And does Congress have any special responsibility when it comes to fact-finding? For example, how does congressional fact-finding compare to fact-finding by academic experts, the media, or a court? Uh, Senator Cohen, I'm gonna start with you again. Okay, well, let me uh, follow up on uh, Norm and say I want to associate myself with the remarks that have been made and say to Senator uh, McCaskill that I'm sorry I didn't have a chance to serve with you in the Senate, and I'm glad you were not there when I was at the Department of Defense. So <laughs> <laughs> let, let me, me talk about the, the fact finding again. Um, Congress's role is to illuminate, uh, to educate, and to legislate. Those are the three main functions of the members of Congress. What we have to do in our legislative responsibilities, try to find out uh, how the laws that we pass are being implemented. Uh, are they being implemented fairly, responsibly, legally, without fraud and abuse? Uh, and so uh, the, I think our responsibility differs from academics uh, who do thought pieces that help uh, us understand issues. It's different from the media uh, that is really out to expose uh, uh, to uh, the American people what they believe Congress is trying to hide. I've had this conversation with uh, Bob Woodward uh, that many people in this country may know. And uh, he sort of wakes up every morning saying, what are they trying to hide from us today? And that's his mission to find out. And so the media has an obligation to find out the how the intricacies of government are, are working and to uh, expose that as well. And, and so we have a different responsibility. Ours carry real consequences. Uh, the others do as well, but not as much as Congress as Norm was just saying. Every one of us find out when we're walking the streets of our cities and towns that people look to us to say, thank you for helping us out. That was a great thing you did in doing for my dad or my mom or whatever. So I think our role uh, as members of Congress is to pass laws for the benefit of the majority of people, for the protection of the minority of people, but to do so on the basis of reason, fairness, uh, and trust. Uh, and so I think our role is quite different from the media and quite different from that of the academics. Thank you. Senator McCaskill. You know, um, I think I, I'm a little jealous of Bill Cohen because he was in the House and in the Senate and even Norm. 
uh, before we got to the point that the tree was being filled and we weren't offering amendments and all the bills were being written in the majority leader's office instead of on committee. Um, and so I watched kind of a degradation of the process of legislating. Um, I was fortunate in that I, my entree was really oversight. I came from a perspective that shining the bright light on something could enact change, whether or not you could get 60 votes. And I kind of was forced into that lane because it became more and more difficult for us to actually get bipartisan legislation done. And it, it was better then than it is now. So, um, and, and we did have different perspectives, but I think the oversight that we did with a partner that was a Republican uh, was more efficient, more effective. And I found that the Republicans I could work with on oversight had a tendency to have staff that was easier to work with. And I had experience working with really good Republican partners, and I was forced into experience with working with really bad Republican partner. Um, I had a Republican partner near the end of my tenure, I won't name any names, Ron Johnson, that made it really difficult for us to do oversight because he wanted to make everything political. He wanted to turn everything into their fault, our fault. So um, we were able to do investigations without him. Uh, our investigation into the pain management industry and how they were impacting court cases behind the curtain and the, the various groups that were formed by the pharmaceutical industry to dress up the reality of opioids. All of that was really done on a non-bipartisan basis, but we were able to move the needle on that stuff. Um, now, on the other hand, with the ones I did with Susan Collins on drug prices, especially Mr. Wu-Tang, Martin Shurkelly, or whatever his name was, and Dara Pram, where he was basically found a, a drug that was needed, but not very marketed heavily, and just blew up the price for people who really needed it just for uh, gross profit. That investigation was really effective because the Collins staff and our staff worked really well together, and Susan and I worked really well together. So I think oversight has a role separate and distinct from legislation. It is always better if you can partner with legislation, but I'm depressed that there aren't more senators today that are focusing on oversight because it's really hard to get legislation done right now. Senator Coleman. Well, if you look at the, uh, the story history of the permanent subcommittee, which I had the, the, the wonderful pleasure of uh, filling as chair, you, know, you, you go back to uh, perhaps a not so pleasant Joe McCarthy uh, period, and then you go to uh, uh, the, uh, John McClellan and, and a chief counsel named Bobby Kennedy doing labor racketeering investigations and with Jimmy Hoffer in front of the committee, uh, go on and on. It, it tells you that congressional investigations, we may not be the media, okay, but we, we have a loud voice. And, and, and so I think it's important that, that we understand that. And by the way, that voice then is, is uh, you know, both uh, Senator Cohn, or Secretary Cohn has mentioned, and, and I've mentioned, you know, it turns into legislation. We, we impact people's lives. Uh, we, we did investigation in, in port security, global investigation, we visited ports around the world. And ultimately worked, it was a major bipartisan bill to uh, Susan Collins, Patty Murray. Uh, and, and uh, you know, we, we were able to make change based on kind of understanding here's the problem, here's the solution. But, but we are a loud megaphone. And, and, and I, I do think it's important, by the way, we're gonna get back, we're gonna touch upon this again, I think a few times during this conversation. You know, you look at, at, at the January 6th commission, which, which is a partisan commission. Partisan in that everyone has one perspective. Uh, and, and if you wanna, if, if you want the public to have confidence in you, you gotta have a process in which they have confidence in the process. Now, if they don't have confidence in the process, regardless of what you find, however important one thinks it is, uh, I, I think we, we, you lose something there. And, and I think historically, if you look at legislation that's been one party legislation, it, it doesn't work out so well. In the end, the beauty of the Senate, that's why I'm so passionate about things like the filibuster, is that, you know, I remember being there and, and so we'd have 54 at one point in time, and so we needed six Democrats. To, to fix to, to, to get past a, a, a you know deal with the filibuster and somebody would say who can speak with Mark Pryor or Mary Landro, Blanche Lincoln. And I gotta believe in their caucus when they were in the majority, they said who can speak to Norm Coleman or Gordon Smith or Mike Lawrence or Susan Collins. Uh, and, and so you know having the working in a bipartisan way, starting with a a, a foundation 
in which people have confidence in the process is absolutely critical. And I think we've lost that today. Uh, and I think anytime you do lose it, you lose the ability for the public to have confidence in what your outcome is. Well, let's talk about process for a minute because I think that's a very important topic that many viewers probably don't understand and don't know anything about. So all three of you have led oversight investigations into complex areas. Could you please describe mechanically what your committees did to reach a consensus on the facts? What did the chair or ranking member do? What did your staffs do? What were the tools and procedures? So just to mix it up a little, Claire, let's start with you. Yeah, um, first of all, you have to have direction as to where you wanna go with the investigation. And that's where uh, the Senator has um, some real input, both senators, uh, that it, hopefully you are working as the chair and ranking or you're working in a bipartisan way and you find a Senator that has the same passion about an issue you do in the other party and off you go. And um, the mechanics are really about digging. It's about gathering documents. It's about lots of letters. It's about um, a, a lot of research. It's about interviews. It's about going, sending staff out to talk to people on the ground in these programs or the impacted by these programs. Uh, sometimes an idea comes from someone you meet. Like I met a family whose father had never received benefits, even though he was victimized by mustard gas experience, experiments when he was in the army in Missouri, at, at, uh, down in Nevada, Missouri they were actually conducting mustard gas experiments on our own soldiers at one point and they were required to keep it a secret for so long that it made it very difficult for them to prove um, because the documents were not accessible to them that was just me meeting somebody on the street on the other hand there were others that came about from national stories but i want to emphasize one thing that i don't think is talked about enough and i don't think many members of congress utilize it enough and that is the reports of inspectors general and the reports of GAO. Whenever we were having a lull in what we needed to investigate, I said, bring me a stack of GAO reports and preferably ones from five years ago. You go through those audit reports and you find stuff. You find stuff that nobody's doing anything about that needs to get fixed. It's an incredible treasure trove of really solid investigative stuff and most people never really, frankly, take the time to read those reports, which is heartbreaking to me as somebody who spent a lot of time auditing. Uh, their performance audits and many of their financial audits are incredibly powerful and largely ignored. Senator Cohen. Um, <laughs> Senator Coleman or? <laughs> Cohen, you. Oh, okay. All right, well, let me uh, come back to the issue of uh, staff and how critical uh, they are to uh, anyone's success. Um, members of the Senate um, are spread very thinly. Uh, I think uh, each of us could say, we're just rushing from committee hearing to committee hearing, trying to keep it up, uh, keep the ball up in the air that we can perform our duties. So who we pick as key staff members uh, and who they pick to help uh, them becomes critical. And I would say from my experience, I, I always had a rule for my, my personal staff and committee staff. I never wanted to, I never asked what their political affiliation was. I had no idea whether a member of my staff was a Republican or a Democrat or independent. To me, it was irrelevant. What I asked for, give me the brightest people you can find uh, that I can work with. I'll deal with the politics. So I don't care what their affiliation is. So having key staff members who can do what um, Claire McCaskill just talked about, who have the time and the ability to go to those GAO reports, to go to the inspector generals, to read and digest it and synthesize it and to present it to you that gives you an opportunity when witnesses come before you and you're trying to really establish the facts, you can take that sword that you can wield by saying, here's what the facts as I understand them are, how does that measure up to what you're testifying to? So the investigative part of it is critical. Uh, I also had the experience of uh, practicing law for three years, I prosecuted cases, for three years I defended cases. And understanding who the perpetrators were, what their backgrounds were, et cetera, becomes critical to getting at the facts. And I think that's, I think that's uh, Claire's experience. I assume Norm's as well. Staff members, we only ride on the top 
it's the staff members who are holding us up with the information they're gathering from all the experts, from the studies that have been done. So it makes our job easier uh, and we make the policy decisions uh, from that point forward. Senator Coleman, and as you talk about this, something you raised earlier, what is the role of the leaders on a committee of instructing their staffs to proceed if possible in a bipartisan way? Did, did you ever actually tell them that? Did that affect the mechanics of what happened? Uh, uh, Claire, I'm actually, Lisa, I'm actually gonna put you on the spot on this one uh, because it, <laughs> it goes back to a, an incident with uh, uh, I had uh, when uh, the, the majority staff at that point, it was you, you being the, the staff chair and, and Senator Levin, were conducting some investigation in which uh, letters were sent out to some of the major, a couple of major Minnesota corporations. And, and I got a call from the CEO of one of them saying, Senator, what's this? The reality is I didn't know about it. I, I think sometimes staff gets a little ahead of the member, occasion, not too often, by the way, but on occasion. And I actually, and I was a little concerned. I, I, it's, you know, the letters can go out from the chair, but typically you have the ranking member, you're doing this together. And in that instance, staff on occasion got out a little ahead of the member. And I, I called think I remember Senator, apologizing about I read it. Well, I called <laughs> Senator Levin. And Senator Levin said to me, heard me out, and he said to me, Norm, it will never happen again. Okay? And it never did. Uh, and, and that is, you know, one having the, the trust and respect of, of that point. He was a chair, I was a ranking member, I had, we had switched positions. Uh, but he, he literally said, it will never happen again. And so staff, it, I know, uh, you know, Bill's right. Staff is critical to this. I mean, I, I had great chiefs of staff, the Ray Shepherds, Mark Greenblatt. They put a team together. What we do, and, and I got a smile because Claire so saw so my thunder about GO reports. Uh, they, they were fabulous. They did great work. The, the investigation we did about federal contractors who were being paid millions of dollars in federal contracts, weren't paying millions in taxes, you know, came from a GAO report, looked at that and said, ah, that's a problem. Let's fix it. Uh, and, and so uh, the chair has a lot of, lot of uh, you know, kind of discretion as to what you want to get involved in. It's just as a matter of process, I can tell you, I, I, I always spoke to the, to the committee chair. Remember, the permanent subcommittee is a subcommittee of the Homeland Security Committee. So I always spoke to my chair. I always spoke to Senator Collins and say, we're going down this path. This is what I'm looking to do. Because you want, you want to check, and maybe there's some sensitivities that you may not have. But in the final analysis, I almost inevitably always worked in a bipartisan way. Any any investigation that I did, I made sure that that and you know, I told the staff, okay, you know, share it. Make sure you're working with the the, the other side, which, which my team then did with you. And you're always fabulous to work with. Uh, and, and so, you know, bipartisan. Uh, check with your committee chair. Uh, but but it, there's no lack of ideas out there, things that are going wrong. I, I can tell you, we could have done investigations in, in Defense Department, misspending, you know, lack of budgetary controls all day, every day uh, of the year. Their budget's so big, Bill, you, you know, they, you, oh, it was like shooting fish in a barrel. Uh, so in the end, you decide what's most important, what's going to have real impact, because you do have impact. A lot of this then becomes legislation, uh, and, and then you take it from there. If I can just add a comment that um, you are right that Senator Levin instructed us personally and very vigorously that what we had to do was act in a bipartisan way. And every once in a while we did slip up and he let us know it. And I think even today that that's something that can be done that two leaders from each side of the aisle can get together with doors closed and give that kind of instruction to their staff and then, as you said, it often has a better impact if it's bipartisan. But what well, I had to do that with my staff too, by the way. I had to do that with my, my staff on it because staff gets very zealous. They go, oh, this is fab. Let's, let's go for it. And I always kind of catch your breath, make sure that you've kind of shopped this with the other side. They know where we're going and they're in accord. If they have a problem, I want to know what it is before we get started. One of the problems plaguing our country today and the impetus in part for this panel is that the two politi major political parties are having a much harder time reaching agreement, even on the facts. Um, factual disagreements in hearings, for example, have become not only routine, but sometimes acrimonious. What's the impact when Congress can't agree on the facts? How does that affect the public, the media, and even problem solving by government? Um, I, I guess, Senator Cohen, let's, let's go back to you. Well, what it does is it uh, 
it causes the American people to distrust our institutions. Um, we've had, you know, the acceleration of, uh, of time uh, has been uh, hitting us from all angles. Uh, we've had pandemics, we've had, um, uh, we've had uh, a different um, climate change, all of the con, uh, all of the confusion in our lives now. We've seen uh, two long wars. Uh, we've had uh, the uh, rise of uh, China economically, the transfer of jobs uh, and the loss of jobs here. All of these issues have contributed to a sense of anxiety and confusion. And when members of Congress uh, cannot agree on basic factual matters, that only builds even greater distrust uh, for government. What is really shocking today is that so many American people no longer have faith in our institutions. So many millions of people, according to recent surveys, believe that it's appropriate to use uh, physical violence to achieve a political objective because we have lost the ability to trust the people that serve us uh, in the institutions that have protected us for all of these years. So when we can't agree, uh, and I think basically uh, both Norm and Claire would agree with us. If American politics is played out between the 40 yard lines, we're basically a slightly right of center country or slightly left of center. And when members of Congress start responding to constituents to place our flags in the end zones, then nothing happens. And when nothing happens, people say government is dysfunctional. You don't solve any problems. You just uh, you just debate them endlessly. You're worrying at each other on, in public, being disrespectful for each other. And I think that really, it comes up from the public and we're pulling, pushing it down. And so what Patrick Moynihan, Daniel Patrick Moynihan said once, we're defining deviancy down. I think we're defining decency down. We no longer act with de decency toward one another. And when that takes place, it lets loose the... Uh, the ability of people to take the law into their own hands to disregard the rules of law and take us down a path toward anarchy or tyranny. So I think we're in a very dangerous point in our lives uh, from a societal point of view, not only here, but all, all across the globe, people are looking at us and say, wait a minute, this is the, the beacon of liberty and they can't make decisions any longer. Who do we place our faith with? China? Russia, Turkey, other countries, but they're, they're worrying now that America no longer is able to make decisions uh, that are based on reason uh, and not passion and, um, and greed and, and, and ambition. Senator Coleman? Yeah, you know, uh, Secretary Cohn is, is, is so right on. Uh, politics, it, we, we play within the 40 yard lines, okay? In other words, if you want to get something done, you got your side, you got to get you know, some folks on the other side. But in the end, we are just so polarized. And, and the polarization, we're polarized by, by the media that we, we listen to and that we watch. We're polarized by where we live, urban east, west coast versus, you know, heartland, middle of America, urban centers versus rural centers. Uh, the, the, the level of the amount of polarization, uh, and, and it's played then to play out in Congress. Uh, with with uh, uh, All you got to be is, is, is the most far left on one side or the far right on the other side to get a nomination. And then that's, that's how you get that. And once you got that, uh, most congressional districts were losing the, the kind of limiting number of competitive districts. Uh, polarization only plays out greater. So the impact of that is then lack of trust on the institutions. And I think that's the great sin. That's the great shame that, that this country is built on great institutions. Okay, they, we, I, we have a constitution that has made us the longest serving and, and still the shining city on the hill democracy in the world. Uh, democracy may be, a, you know, a, a terrible thing, but but look at everything else out there. Okay, if you look at a, any of our hills, the thing when I say terrible, if you look at some of the things that we're not doing well, uh, we're still the shining city on the hill. We're the place that people want to come to. And I fear, God forbid, we lose that. And, and we'll, we'll lose it if, if our institutions are devalued. People don't have trust in Congress, don't have trust in the Supreme Court, don't have trust in law enforcement, uh, don't have trust in local government. And, and so I, I think we're at, at a critical moment here. And, and I would hope that there'd be some way I'm kind of looking for leadership that goes beyond polarization. We've had a lot of presidents that have promised to bring people together and they get in office and it doesn't happen. And for whatever reason, whether it's playing to a base, it doesn't on both sides of the aisle, by the way, this is not just a D problem or an R problem. 
but but uh, we, we 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 desperately need leadership at the local, state, federal level that is willing to and trying to pull people together rather than dividing us further. Senator Caskell, if I can layer in uh, before you respond, we had a question from the audience that said building trust seems to be a critical piece in the process of fact finding and oversight. How did the senators build trust during successful oversight investigations and what lessons might we learn from that? So you don't well, have to just take that, but just to yeah, as well as talk yeah. about let me Let me address that first. You build trust by building relationships and you, you get into a situation where the other member sees that you're not gonna throw them under the bus, that if there's a, a difficult moment, you're gonna talk it out and figure out a way forward without demonizing the other side. It's just basic stuff. Um, you know, politics is all about human nature and how you use human nature for the benefit of the greater good. Um, but I'm, I'm gonna say something pretty controversial here. I don't think we've always had leaders that wanted to bring people together. I think we have a standout different leader that set us on a path. I'm not saying it's all his fault, but the old phrase that facts are stubborn things, turns out they aren't if someone's willing to lie. And if that person has such a megaphone that members of Congress are afraid to correct him, members of Congress are afraid to stand up to him, the reason Watergate worked is because the Republicans stood up and said the right thing. The reason I be beat Todd Aiken wasn't because I did a, some trickery in the primary. The reason I be beat Todd Aiken is because the Republicans stood up and said what Todd Aiken had said was bad. It was John McCain and it was Mitt Romney and it was Mitch McConnell, it was all of them saying that Todd Aiken shouldn't come to the Senate. That's what's gone now. When someone lies as easily as most people brush their teeth and they are the most powerful man on the planet, we get into trouble. And when you have someone who has done that as the main, the main part of their service, to lie when necessary, to save their skin or make themselves look better, and they are not corrected by their party, then we get down a slippery slope. I'm not saying it's all his fault, and I'm not saying Democrats uh, aren't guilty of sins on the extremism front. I agree with everything Norm and Bill have said, but lying makes the facts disappear and makes real results impossible. Let me ask you this. Um, you talked about, you began talking about relationships. And I think a lot of people in the public don't understand why that's important or how it's important. And Senator Levin believed that working side by side with colleagues from the other side of the aisle to find facts, and as he liked to say, get to the heart of the matter, actually helped build strong relationships and made compromise more possible. And I wanted to ask you, have the, each of you experienced that can bipartisan fact-finding foster mutual respect between lawmakers on opposite sides of the aisle and help tamp down some of that polarization? Is that an old-fashioned notion that doesn't apply anymore, or is it something that's, that's still important? Uh, Senator Cohen. Well, I want to come back to the issue of decency once again. Um, I had the benefit of uh, working with Carl. I'm going to... Um, uh, I'm going to exercise my seniority here. I had the benefit of serving with Carl for 18 years uh, in the uh, in the Senate, and both on the Armed Services Committee and the Oversight Committee. So he and I uh, traveled the world together. Uh, and the one thing, uh, when I first came to Congress, I had a recommendation. It said the first thing you have to do, in addition to get your committee assignment, is go to the gym. And I said, okay. Uh, and I, I used to play basketball in high school and college. And I said, great. But the recommendation was to go to the gym and play sports against one another, engage in uh, competitive activity. You're in the sauna or the showers and people are singing and you're building relationships based upon a friendship. And the one thing that I had learned, have learned during all of these years don't assume the worst thing about another person. We live in a country of great diversity, racially, ethnically, religiously, and culturally. What binds us together 
but the rule of law and respect for the rule of law. And Claire is absolutely right. You can't have someone lie as a perpetual basis uh, of leadership. But when you, when you uh, compete together on the athletic field, when you dine together uh, in the Senate in the old days when I was there, they had a kind of a separate room for Republicans and Democrats in the private room. I would always make sure I would go periodically into the Democrats room and dine there. I wrote books with Democrats. Gary Hart and I wrote a novel together. George Mitchell and I wrote a report about Iran-Contra together. And what I have found is nothing takes place unless you have trust in the person that you're working with. You expect their decency, their honesty, and their difference of opinion and their, the state from which they come. I could not get elected in Norm State. I could not get elected in, uh, in Missouri. I could get elected in Maine. I come from a different state with different, uh, a different tradition and culture. But I find in working with all of the other members, if I respect them and what their constituencies uh, insist upon um, on, on them representing, then I can work toward understanding them and building that trust. So I think it's just a question of, of uh, stopping the hostility and seeing each other as enemies. It's okay, we're competitors philosophically. The one thing we share is we want to do what's best for the American people, that's our job. Senator McCaskill. I, I agree with Bill. Um, I, to this day, am close, dear friends with a number of my Republican colleagues. And I, um, I had the pleasure of working closely with John McCain on some issues. And I had the pleasure of him coming after me with fangs <laughs> bared on a number of occasions. Right. Um, but when, they, when those fights were over, we were friends. Um, we disagreed about some things, but uh, we had a lot of things we agreed on. And I could go through almost every Republican member I served with then. I think the difference is now that th the politics of primaries, as Norm referenced earlier, make it much harder for people to be proud of their bipartisan relationships. Um, you know, I used to laugh. Nobody ever called my office to say, you know, we just want Senator McCaskill to compromise. Nobody ever lobbied me for compromise. The extremes are the noisiest. And the, the members that are the most successful are the ones that can turn down the noise and listen to the majority and try to find common ground. But there's not a lot of political winning in that formula right now. I hope it comes back. I hope the voters express themselves and say, you know, we don't, we want people who get things done. We don't want people who are trying to get on the evening, make a viral moment in the committee, um, you know, a la, you know, and I could name a far left or a far right person here. And we could probably fill in the blanks right now without me saying their names. And so I, I think um, we are just at a dark moment for the middle. And the middle is where things actually happen that have a lasting impact. Like Norm said, we can swing back and forth. We can outlaw guns in one Congress and then make every gun legal in the next one. We can cut taxes in one Congress and then raise taxes in the next one. But that doesn't provide the certainty that this country needs and that this democracy ought to be able to produce. Senator Coleman, um, what about your experience? Did you have that experience that doing fact-finding together could encourage respect for people on the other side of the aisle? I, I witnessed it all the time, but the, in part, it gets back to the, the kind of the personalities and, and the culture, the environment at the moment. And, and at least we're simply perhaps in a different place today. And, and I, I don't know whether we can get back to that. I'd hope we can. Our institutions are still institutions. Again, I, you know, we're still the great, you know, shining city on the hill. But, but on the other hand, you know, you, you probably don't have that. You don't have that today when, what I had with Carl Levin. And yet I do have to say, you know, turn off C-SPAN. You talk to, uh, I talk to my former colleagues. They have friends on both sides of the aisle. We're not all sitting shirts and skins in separate corners over there. But it is more challenging. And I, listen, I got to say something for the, the, the average person sitting out there in the heartland, who, by the way, doesn't think he's, he or she is getting the facts from the mainstream media. They don't think that they're getting facts from the ruling party. They doesn't think they're getting facts from the president that, that are straightforward. And, and so there's a lot of distrust out there and, about to, and, and it's on both sides and goes both ways. Uh, and the question is, can we somehow get beyond that? 
Uh, and, and in this environment today that is so polarized, I'm not sure what the answer is. I, I'm an optimist. I want to wake up with a smile. I want to go to sleep with a smile, but, but I'm, I'm still, I'm not so sure. Uh, and, and until we see leadership that really does kind of get beyond the partisan divide, doesn't play to the base, just to the base, then we're going to have a problem. And, and, and I don't think that we're seeing it yet. Can I, can I jump in here with one other, one other comment? Uh, I didn't have to contend with this uh, during the time of my years in public service, service but the uh, emergence of social media makes it almost impossible to reach consensus today. Um, I, I always like to think of the internet and uh, all of the technology we have to communicate globally now instantaneously. It's like a, a river. Uh, uh, pure water. Uh, but what's happened, we're seeing the sewer rising up to muddy the water. And it's very hard for people today to determine, well, what's true, what's false? Who is putting out information or disinformation? It has become so difficult because of the proliferation of social, social media where there's no filter. Uh, at times when I was in office, we had a filter. The mass media would be CBS, NBC, ABC, then the print media, you would have filters there. If you wrote a letter to the editor, you had to put your name, your address, and they would then check to see whether you were the person sending that letter. That no longer exists. So you have people who have an opportunity to have a voice who not necessarily should be listened to, but they're flooding. They're flooding the, uh, the gates. And so it comes back to whether we believe uh, in a regulated society or an unregulated. For example, you can have freedom without order, it'll produce anarchy. If you have order without freedom, you have tyranny. So the question is, can we, can we continue to have a river? Because a river without banks is not a river, it's a flood. And that's the danger we face right now, where all of this information is flowing through the medium, both uh, traditional, mainstream, and social. And it makes it virtually impossible to reach a consensus with the vast majority of the American people. I hope Norm is right. I hope uh, we wake up with a smile every morning and, and go to bed. And I don't do that. I worry that we're on the precipice of going in a direction that will be difficult to come back from. And well, let's, let's, let's talk jump about... In. I was just going to jump, jump in and, and maybe offer a little different perspective because but I got to say, I, I worry about the filter. I, I worry about it. If, if, you know, if, in fact, I pour all the information you want out there. And in the end, you know, I trust the American public. Let's do a better job of educating our kids. Let's do a better job. But I really worry. And, and, I, and I, I think I reflect a lot of folks out there who worry about if we put the filters on in a certain way, that in the end, you, you, it's, it's going to help one side and not the other. So I just want to be real careful about filters. Let the American public, you know, trust that they're smart enough to distinguish between good and bad, right and wrong. And, and if they're not, well, then we got a problem. But I'm real, real cautious, Bill, about filters. Well, well I'd like not... to take that conversation and think about it in a little bit more concrete terms with, in terms of the January 6th committee, sort of the highest profile oversight investigation going on right now. Uh, the committee is purely striving to reach bipartisan consensus on the facts and persuade the public about what is true and what is false. And I'd like to ask each of you if you think they're succeeding or not succeeding and why. And let's start with Senator McCaskill. I think they're being um, extremely successful with a caveat. They're never going to move about 20 to 24 percent of the country that is totally enamored with the big lie and is gonna to continue to believe that somehow, even though the facts do not indicate this occurred, that somehow that election was fraudulent. Um, it is done permanent damage to our democracy. It, the jury is out whether or not we recover, but the way they have presented and the thing that has been brilliant about their presentation, and I don't know if this could be a new norm because the bottom line is senators and congressmen want their moment at the microphone, but they have made this about presenting the facts and not about grabbing the spotlight. And the other thing they've done is almost 98% of the information has come from Trump supporters. They are not calling witnesses except the inner circle of the Trump administration. 
his cabinet members, his campaign, his family, his, the people in the White House. These were all people that would fall on a sword for Donald Trump. And the fact that they have been very strategic about keeping the witnesses to the Trump circle I think has been very powerful for a lot of independent voters out there. And I think it will go down in history as maybe one of the most effective committees, even though that 20 to 25% of the people out there will always say it was unfair um, because the Republicans decided they didn't want to participate. Now, Senator Coleman, I know you have a different view. What, what's your view of the well, by the way, it wasn't, it, it wasn't that the Republican didn't want to participate. It's that that, that, that uh, Speaker Pelosi, you know, set in place saying, here's who the speaker, here's who the you know, participants could be and who they couldn't be. The bottom line is, is listen, I think that's, that uh, January 6th was a bad day for American democracy. I think the president didn't handle himself well on that day. But I think this committee from the very beginning is, is, has been flawed. That they should have had folks with a different perspective. Not everyone on the committee should have support, you know, supported impeaching the president. And so failing to do that in the end, if you don't have the support of, of, of uh, the public to think that this is fair, that's cross-examination. You had, you know, Cassidy Hudson gave some compelling testimony, but, but it was all what somebody told her. And there should have been someone on that committee to question that. If, and, and perhaps you'd have ultimately more confidence in the outcome. So I think process is critical. I think that process was flawed from the beginning. Again, bad day for America. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's something that in, in the end, I think deserved a closer look, but it should have been done in a way that's bipartisan, absent being bipartisan. I think in the end, some, it's, it's not gonna move as Claire said, a certain percentage of the public uh, and, and uh, whether it will have any lasting impact, I can't tell you. Let me, I gotta jump in here because I wanna make sure that I'm clear what I was referring to. I wasn't referring to this committee. I was referring to the bipartisan commission. The bipartisan commission where Republicans would have had equal opportunity to subpoena witnesses, control where the subpoenas went. It would have been all about a completely bipartisan, even number of members from both sides. The reason we didn't have a bipartisan commission was because McCarthy and McConnell decided they didn't wanna do it for political reasons. And that's why we don't have a bipartisan effort right now. So I wasn't referring to the, the, the skirmish over who sat on the House committee. I was referring to the Republicans' decision to deep six a bipartisan commission that I think would have been more effective. I would like to just make the point that I do see this committee as bipartisan. I think Liz Cheney is a Republican. So I, that's my viewpoint. I think Adam Kingslinger is too. But Senator Cohen, uh, what's your perspective? Well, I think the committee uh, is doing a terrific job, frankly, in trying to get at the heart of what is involved. Um, perhaps it's because of my background, uh, both in the impeachment committee, uh, the House Judiciary Committee and Iran-Contra, that I think I uh, have a pretty good understanding of uh, what someone's intent is when they're carrying out a, a particular act. The committee is really trying to resolve the issue. We know that the president, President Trump uh, inspired a group of his supporters to march to Capitol Hill. We're now finding out, for example, that he was aware that the, some of those that were marching were armed. Uh, we're finding out facts as they unfold uh, that there was an attempt uh, to stop the transition of power by the vice president certifying uh, the, uh, the election. So uh, for me, uh, the notion that, oh, the president didn't know what he was doing, uh, I, I think that's unrealistic. I think with the committee in its manner of having Liz uh, Cheney, having uh, Adam Kensinger uh, as conservative Republicans going after the facts to say, this is what the president of the United States did. In addition to making phone calls to officials in Georgia, in, a, in addition to try to intimidate witnesses, these are facts that are being established. Now, others may come to a different conclusion. They're, what is striking to me, Norm, about having no filter uh, in terms of all of the information that's going out is that so many millions of the American people believe that Joe Biden was not elected, that the elections were not fair. How do they come to that conclusion? Is it through uh, information which has been deliberately put out into the, through the media that says it's, it was a fake election. There were false. Uh, there were thousands and millions of votes that were fake. I mean, it's to me, it's astounding 
the notion that a president of the United States would call up uh, an official in Georgia and say, can you find me 11,870 votes or 780 votes? If, if I can also ask- Let me, let me, let me just conclude on that, that issue. So I think the committee is doing a good job, Norm. Uh, would I wish there had been a, um, a bipartisan commission? Yes, but to have put members of the house who were participants in working with the president in terms of uh, accommodating that rally on Capitol Hill, that would have been a disaster for the integrity of the committee. Let, let me ask you this, because this is sort of an interesting question. One criticism of the committee's hearings uh, is that the committee has already made up its mind. And that raises the question of the purpose of a congressional oversight hearing. Is it your experience that with most major investigative hearings, the committee has already done that hard work of uncovering the facts and the hearings are a way to present those facts to the public? Or even more broadly, should investigative hearings be used to uncover new facts or fulfill that role of presenting the facts that the committee has already found? So Senator Coleman, what do you think? So it's actually at least it's, it's, it's a little of both. You know, there are often times that you do an investigation and you've got the, the conclusions of your investigation and then you have, have the hearing to kind of lay that out. There are other times where in fact, you have a, a real investigatory process. You know, in terms of the January 6th commission, they may, there may be two Republicans on there, but they all have the same perspective regarding Donald Trump. And if you want to challenge anything, you have to have somebody with a different perspective. So I, I think the committee undermined itself when, when, when Speaker Pelosi made a decision about who was going to serve on that uh, and, and who she wouldn't allow to serve. I think it undermined whatever potential credibility, however one thought, uh, you know, should have been done, what the consequences, et cetera. I think you're never going to get there. And, and, and certainly for a broad segment of the public, that's what they think. But the bottom line is you can do it both ways. There's nothing wrong with, with having a, a, doing a, a review as staff has done and then presenting that and saying, this is what it is. Here's the results of our investigation. Uh, on the other hand, there are times that I think you can actually use a committee, pro use the process to do an investigation. I think in January 6th, I think they've done their, they, they have their conclusion. Uh, they, they kind of know what it is and they're kind of laying out the narrative to support that conclusion. In the end, I don't think that generates the kind of trust and confidence that goes beyond partisan, that goes beyond the partisan divide. Senator Cohen? Uh, what is the alternative version of what happened on January 6th? I am curious. Uh, is it that uh, there was no attack upon the Capitol, that there was no break-in uh, to the doors of the Capitol, that members of Congress were not under threat of death or hanging? Is there an alternative view uh, of those facts that everybody saw and bore witness to? So I don't know what the alternative version or vision of what took place on January 6th is. And it's like saying there's, let's look at the alternative uh, facts about slavery. Uh, or Jim Crow, what's the alternative vision? Was that good, was it bad? I mean, I don't understand when people say, let's have an alternative version of what took place. If you're saying that members of Congress believe that the president didn't engage in impeachable conduct by sponsoring or supporting an effort to overturn the election, I don't know uh, if you can justify saying that. So I think the committee is saying, yeah, an attack took place, we were there, we were under death threats, we're now going to investigate in terms of who inspired this. Did the president uh, have um, an, a role in this? Was he a conspirator in this? How did this come about? And we're uncovering the fact that there's a missing um, uh, Secret Service tapes. It's like Rosemary Woods back in Watergate. You had an 18 and a half minute gap. How did that happen? Well, the committee investigated to find out how it happened. Now we're going to investigate why did the Secret Service eliminate all their records as far as text messages? So there are facts yet to be determined. But I think uh, the notion that somehow there's an alternative version of what happened on January 6th, uh, I find that difficult to accept, Norm. Senator McCaskill, I'd like to ask you, what do you think about presenting your conclusions versus using hearings to investigate? Well, I, I agree with Norm that sometimes it's a little of both. Um, you know, we wanted the CEO of Backpage there because we wanted to ask him serious questions about the conduct of his company and in trafficking young girls on the go-to place to buy young girls for sex, underage girls for sex. And um, th that questioning would have been important. 
So we wanted him there as a witness. And as you indicated in the introduction, Elise, you know, we couldn't get him there. He ended up in prison, which was where he belonged. But um, we, we had to go all the way to the Supreme Court uh, to try to compel his testimony. So um, on the other hand, when you do a long, serious investigation, when you interview, whether it's January 6th or whether it's some of the investigations Carl did on uh, companies avoiding taxes by going overseas or, uh, or some of the very long investigations I was a part of, by the time you get to the hearing, you have compiled just mountains of evidence, facts that lead you to a certain place. And there's nothing wrong with being hooked to those facts at a hearing. There is nothing wrong with relying on those facts at that hearing. That doesn't mean you're skewed or biased. It means you've looked for the facts, you've found the facts, and now you want to present those facts to the public. And that's what I think the January 6th committee has done. Could there have been some, uh, you know, posturing by Jim Jordan over that was hearsay or you weren't there or uh, why don't we talk about Black Lives Matter and Antifa and the, nobody, you know, the only person who fired a gun inside the Capitol was the Capitol Police. We could hear all that, but it wouldn't change the facts. And I think they've done a pretty good job of just passionately with Trump witnesses showing the facts. Let me ask all three of you another question about measuring the success of the January 6th committee in terms of whether it, it actually moves the public or gets them to accept their version of the facts. Um, one of our portraits in oversight, which we have on the Levin Center, uh, looked at an investigation back in the 1870s about the Ku Klux Klan. It was a new organization at the time. Uh, there was an investigation as to did it exist and what was it doing? Uh, the committee at the time produced reams of facts, hearings, lengthy reports, saying that the KKK did exist and that it was terrorizing Southern communities. But at the time, many people in the public just didn't buy it. They just did not accept what that committee had found. Uh, but now a hundred years later, the evidence that they gathered is considered pretty overwhelming. And it is still used today to discredit the KKK, which is still in operation. You know, Congress was not, was not able to get it discredited to the point where it disbanded. So my question here is, should we be evaluating the January 6th committee in terms of its immediate impact on public understanding of what happened? Or should we be looking at uh, the evidence it's gathering in the long run? So it's kind of a long question, sorry about that. Um, <laughs> um, Senator Cohen, what do you think? I think it's gonna be difficult to uh, measure any immediate success. I think what they are doing, again, is illuminating uh, facts. And I guess I would take issue when you say that people have uh, a different version of the facts. I don't think you can have a different version of the facts. I think you can have different opinions about what the facts are. I don't think you can have a different version of facts. And that gets into the whole issue of alternative facts. Alternative facts, I think we're in a, a, a leading toward a post-truth era. <laughs> where you say that that's not true. I have, a, I have an alternative factual situation. I think you can have a different opinion, but not a different fact. But in any event, uh, I, I think the long term will depend upon uh, what appeal they have, the committee will have uh, to the people who are so-called independents. I don't think I agree with, agree with uh, Claire. I don't think you'll change uh, many of the Republican views. The political polls are now showing that 90% of Republicans um, agree uh, to uh, with uh, President, former President Trump, or 49, 50% would support him again. So I don't think you're going to shake that solid base of Republican support one way or the other with this particular um, committee. I think what they will have the chance to do is influence those who are trying to decide what do we want to do as a country moving forward? Uh, do we want to say, as the Republican Party has said, that the, uh, the thing that took place on January 6th was a, um, a acceptable political expression. I don't think so. Uh, and so I think what the committee will do is say, no, that's not the way we want to go. We do not want to have a situation where we're encouraging people to use violence in order to make or secure a political point of view. 
Uh, so I think the, the, the committee will have influence, certainly with the Democrats, although not all of them will agree, but most of them will. And I think their, their hearings will have an impact on those who are in the middle or in uh, so-called independents saying, our country's in danger right now. We could go the way of having a very authoritarian form of government. Democracies, if you look historically, do not enjoy long, happy lives. They enjoy sh short, happy lives, and then they disappear because there is a loss of trust and confidence, and therefore the law is taken into one's own hands. And now we have the situation where armed militias are now being acceptable forms of political expression. So I think we're at a tipping point uh, that we're either coming back to the notion that we're going to believe in the rule of law and that everybody is subject to the rule of law, or we're going to say the law is only for some people and not for others, and power comes at the end of, uh, of uh, the fist. I don't think that's where we want to go, but I think that that's the impact I hope this committee will have is to remind people what the rule of law really means, and if we lose it, it will be very difficult to get it back. Senator Coleman, what do you think in terms of measuring the success of the January 6th committee in the short term versus the long term? Again, I just sort of repeat myself here. I, I, I think a, a terrible mistake was made uh, in, in kind of forming this committee and not assuring that you had multiple perspectives, not, not multiple political parties, but multiple perspectives. And probably the central question is what's the role of the president? And everyone in that committee had one perspective that did, didn't change. And so in the end, I, you know, I, we're not, I, just, I agree with Bill, there should be one version of the facts, but, but you have to have a process in place that people trust these are the facts. You had a witness come forward who, who said the president you know, did this in a car and said this. Well, if you want to get to the facts, what about having the person who's in the car said that, you know, testify before the committee? They had access to that person rather than taking somebody said that somebody said and presenting that as the facts. And so you're not going to have confidence in, 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 in what are the facts if people don't think they're, that it's, you know, cross-examination is one of the great tools of oh. democracy. You, right. you question somebody and say, so, okay, so, you know, who told you that? And, and were you there? Uh, and, and then you try to get the person who actually heard it, get them to, to testify. So the point being, I, I think we, if we don't have confidence in the process, then, then you lose the value of what comes out of it short-term and long-term. And I think that's the great tragedy of January 6th. I think it, it, it was a bad day for America. I think it, it deserved to be examined. As by the way, it, there are a lot of other things that happen in terms of violence against institutions that are, could also be examined. And they probably will be if Republicans get control of the House. But in the end, rather than getting to our corners, can we somehow find a way to kind of come together in a bipartisan fashion, set, to, set up a process that people on both sides of the aisle have trust in, and in the end, then if you get the facts, then, then perhaps you'd have greater confidence that those are the facts. Senator Coleman, okay. I have to tell you that um, the philosophy of Senator Levin and the Levin Center is one that's in alignment with what you've just been saying. That if you wanna have a really accurate investigation that you want people have fundamentally different world views because they challenge each other and they engage in a process where each side has to convince the other but it also assumes that that will be a good faith process. And sometimes we had one question from the audience is how does Congress defend itself uh, against members who refuse to recognize the facts? Will you show them the facts? They have no evidence on their side, but they maintain their position anyway. So I think those are two very difficult things to reconcile, but, but your approach is exactly the approach of Senator Levin, which is to have people who have different viewpoints engage in a process to come to consensus if they can. So Senator McCaskill, what's your, your reaction? Well, um, I, I, I feel very strongly about the Bipartisan Commission. I thought the only tell that this was political protection by the Republicans was that they didn't want a Bipartisan Commission like we had after 9-11, that I think did really good work. Um, they didn't want that. And I think that is um, something that tells me that from their perspective, it was about trying to make this go away. If the facts were ugly here, as it turns out, they are. And I, you can argue about hearsay and throw her testimony out. Let's just do Bill Barr's testimony 
somebody who did everything the president wanted for years. Uh, it's very clear that this president rejected the rule of law, 60 different court cases, rejected his own attorney general, rejected the facts that were presented to him over and over again, and wanted to go outside the law and hold on to power. That should be enough that the Republicans should say, yeah, we need a bipartisan commission. It wasn't. And it's just like the Ku Klux Klan investigation. The reason that didn't work then, it was just politics. The reason this is not a bipartisan commission is politics. Now, do I think it's gonna have long-term impact? I do. I think Liz Cheney will go down as one of the most courageous political figures in this era because she did what no other Republican was willing to do. She was willing to say the Constitution is more important than politics. It is more important, even though I have a more conservative voting record than everyone that is pointing fingers at me. Every time I have voted, I have voted the most conservative way possible. I have a pedigree of conservative in the Republican Party. But she cares about the Constitution more than she cares about having fealty to Donald Trump and what he represents in this country. And I think in the long run, history is going to show this committee as very effective. It will be looked upon as a way to effectively get information out to independent voters and middle of the road voters. And I think she will go down as someone to emulate for people who wanna do oversight in the future. We have, thank you for all of those reactions. Just to me, a fascinating conversation. Um, we had a question from the audience uh, making a comparison between the January 6th committee investigation and Watergate and saying that after Watergate, uh, there was a big impact on who got elected and it led to a lot of different kinds of changes. And I'm wondering if you see that as happening. Is, could this committee, rather than having immediate or long-term, you know, leaving that aside on the factual question, is it having some sort of impact on the types of leaders we want to elect? Because in, in the end, the American public gets the leaders that they select. And we, we've seen that voters just recently, for example, in Maryland, they chose a person who was a very strong Trump supporter and says that the 2020 election was unfair versus a moderate Republican who said, I'm not worried about that kind of stuff. I wanna do problem solving. But uh, the Trump supporter won by 16, 16 percentage points. So what do you think about that comparison between January 6th and Watergate uh, and in terms of how it might affect future elections. And I've forgotten who, who we should go with. <laughs> <laughs> Something jumped I'll in. start, I'll start. Um, I, I, I think um, the Republican party uh, has a little bit of a civil war going on, most of it behind the curtain. Uh, Mitch McConnell and others are trying very hard to elect people in primaries that can appeal ap across the spectrum. Uh, whose appeal goes a little bit broader than just the Trumpists. On the other hand, the Trump supported candidates have done well in some states. You have a candidate out in Arizona that is totally down with the big lie that somehow Donald Trump actually won in 2020. Uh, you have Donald Trump just within the last couple of weeks still trying to get the election results overturned in Wisconsin. Uh, you have the example in Maryland where Donald Trump's candidate won. I think certainly in Ohio, uh, Donald Trump's candidate won. So now it's up to the people. Now we'll see. We'll see in the midterms if those Trump candidates are successful in general elections. They certainly are still have, he still has a huge hold on the Republican Party. It is not like Watergate because the Republican Party did not reject Donald Trump after what he did. Uh, they could have. Uh, you know, Kevin McCarthy, Mitch McConnell, all of them could have had a press conference and said, no, we're not going to go along with a president who refused to pass power peacefully. We're not going to go along with a president who wants to work outside the law to hold on to power. We're done. But they didn't do that because they were worried about the impact on whether or not they could be Speaker of the House or Majority Floor Leader. So I think the final chapter has not been written on what impact the 1-6 Committee and what happened on January 6th is gonna have on this country long term, I think it hurts the Republican party short term uh, because we've got a lot of other problems right now in the country with the pandemic and inflation and 
uh, you know, mistakes that have been made by the Democrats. Uh, they, they may have a midterm that says that what Donald Trump did was okay. Uh, I hope not, but they may. Well, I think the question was uh, the impact of the January 6th commission. Uh, and and uh, the answer is we may kind of pride ourselves on all the uh, coverage we get on congressional investigations, no matter how big, how, how, how newsworthy. But they're not going to. It's not going to have an impact on, on November. It probably won't have. It's not going to have an impact in 2024. Uh, the price of a gallon of gas is going to have an impact. The debacle in Afghanistan is going to have an impact. The debacle at the border is going to have an impact. Uh, and we see that. We see that in all the polling. We see that it's clear what's going to happen in the House. So uh, it, it, this is. If the question is what impact is this going to have on the electoral process, uh, the answer is is, is nil. Is, is almost. I think almost nothing. And I, I put that in an envelope. I seal it, and we'll look at it in November. And I think that's what's going to play out. There are American public is concerned about things that affect them in their life today. And that is the price of a gallon of gas. It is whether the police are being defunded. It is whether America is lack of, you know, less respected in the world today because of Afghanistan. Uh, and so you look at those things. And in the end, that's what's going to move voters in November. Uh, again, this is a commission uh, that uh, if, if we keep saying, getting back to the same point, uh, if, if there was a way that you could have actually had uh, a wider variety of voices to be heard, you know, perhaps you would get a greater response and greater credibility. But in, from a political perspective, I think we're all, you know, we've all been through the process here. Uh, I don't think anyone thinks that this commission is going to have a big impact in November either 2022 or, or November 2024. Senator Cohen? Well, I think Norm may be right on this in terms of its impact, but that would be a sad uh, conclusion, I think, to reach. Um, yes, the economy surely does matter. Price of gas matters. The price of food matters. The fact that we have supply chain interruptions, et cetera, all contributing to inflation. That really matters. But that in the future will change. We've had it before. We've had double digit inflation before. We've had double uh, digit um, uh, interest rates before. Uh, and so that will come down, whether through a Republican administration or another Democratic administration, that will come down as things take place throughout the world that we can't predict at this particular moment. But what we can predict is if we allow an attack upon the constitutional form of government, that will matter uh, to the American people short term and long term, because that's something once it's gone, you will not get back. You may have a different form of government. It may be that the majority of the American people say, we want an authoritarian figure because democracy as it's currently structured doesn't work because you guys or gals cannot make a decision. So therefore we want someone to take authority who will be tough and get things done. Well, again, it comes back to, do you want an authoritarian figure an authoritarian form of government uh, which has more order, less liberty? Or do you want to make the democracy that we have fought for for the last couple of hundred years to work? And how do we make it work? You, would, you make it work by electing people to represent you. And this is something I just want to get off my shoulders for, for a moment. Every one of us who have served, we have been elected as trustees. We are fiduciaries. A fiduciary has you a higher uh, burden to carry because people expect more from us. We expect us to be honest, honorable, reasonable, factual. And so we have to measure up to that responsibility of a fiduciary. And I don't ever want to see it reduced saying, well, it's just someone being, you know, uh, give, him a, give him a cut over here. He didn't really mean it. I want the strictest interpretation possible of what our duties are. And I can tell you that when we served, there was not one thing that has been done recently that would not have pushed us out of office overnight. One allegation of misconduct, one allegation of a scandal, we would have been on our way back home. So what I want to do is maintain... I want to maintain that high standard. And that's something that we won't get back if we allow it to go unpunished or unaccounted for. We're almost at the end of our time. So just even though we could go on much longer, I think we have to get to the wrap up stage. So what I'd like to do is give each of you two minutes to share any advice you would have for members of Congress and about fact finding as a whole. Uh, for Congress. So I'm gonna give you each two minutes and uh, let's start with Norm, with Senator Coleman, excuse me. 
Oh, uh, Jill, I got to say that that I, I totally we are fiduciaries and, and we want people with a kind of the highest standard. And, and you're right. Things that, that today, you know, you can say you do that. They would have come have been out so quick. Uh, and so, you know, I find that it, it, in a way it, it is it's rather heartbreaking. The fact is that there are institutions. Congress has this tremendous ability, this tremendous power to investigate, to identify wrongs, and then to put in place a, a, a process to, to get that information out and then find the resolution. And I've always seen that the best way to do that is what the Levin Center is, is really all about. And that is to get people with different perspectives who may disagree on the resolution, to get them to somehow work together, to identify what the problem is and come to agreement on this is the problem and these are the facts. And then when you do that, we can find a way to resolve that. I hope that that, that ability is still there. I pray that it's there. I, I, I just, I believe in America. I believe in, in, in democracy. I believe in our systems of, of justice and laws. And, and, and so, uh, you know, we just have to strive harder and hopefully, hopefully the public will do their part because in the end, they are the deciders. They're gonna determine who represents them. And, and, and I hope in the end that we can, we can elect people who really want to work in a bipartisan way. We're really willing to listen to somebody and say, you know something, you may have an idea that's better than mine. Or what I thought before, I may not be right. Uh, and that's what Carl Levin was about. That's what Norm Cohn was about. I think that's what Bill Cohn and Tom McCaskill were about. And if we get back to that, we're going to be a lot better served. Uh, that isn't the reality today on both sides of the aisle. And, and so I'm hoping for a brighter future. I think the institutions or the framework is in place. Let's see if we can kind of get people there who really want to work together and solve problems because that's what the public deserves. Senator McCaskill? Um, if I were going to give advice to a new member of Congress, I would say first find something you really care about that you would like to either expose or change. Secondly, find a member on the other side of the aisle that has the same passion for that subject that you do and see what you agree on and try to develop a plan of action between the two of you. This next thing is to try to get on the committee that would allow you access to that um, amount of information that you need to actually move the needle, whether it's by public disclosure or legislation. So picking the committees is very important, which ones you pick. Um, nobody wanted to be on Homeland Security, but I knew it was the home of PSI. And so it was really easy for me to get on that committee and it was, a, a wonderful place for me to spend time as a senator. And then um, probably the most important is staff. Um, I said I'd begin with it and end with it. Um, find staff that understand what investigations are about. If you got to poach GAO, if you have to poach state auditor's offices, um, find people who have done a performance audit. Find people who understand the search for payrolls without a purpose who understand uh, that there is all kinds of ways to expose ways that public money is being wasted, that have a passion for investigation. Make sure they're really smart and make sure they're not afraid of you. Make sure you can take bad news. Make sure you do not shirk from them getting in your face and saying, Claire, you are full of it. You are wrong about this. It's not what the facts show. And if you can do that, you will have great success on behalf of the American people. Senator Cohen. Well, a, a former senator named Ed Muskie had some great advice uh, for, uh, for me. He said, if you can't improve on silence, don't. So I, I would say I can't improve on what um, Claire McCaskill has said and Norm Coleman. And I just want to say to Norm, uh, I wish we had a chance to serve together uh, as Republicans. Uh, I would have brought a, a slightly different um, uh, level uh, of my concerns uh, to the table than you. But I, I would have enjoyed it because you are the kind of conservative that really uh, stands out, uh, that is, uh, is sent to Congress to do the right thing and go to Congress for the right reason. And to just cap, really uh, touch upon what, McK uh, what uh, Claire has said, I think before you do anything is understand why do you want to be a public servant? Why do you want to go to Congress? Why do you want to put yourself through everything you've got to do to go to that office? What is your purpose? What is your ambition? What are your ideals? That self-knowledge, I think, is helpful so that when you do get elected and you do go to Congress, you bring all of those values that you uh, have and understand that you have to represent the people. So I can't improve on what uh, Claire McCaskill said and Norm. 
uh, I'm just thankful to you, to the Levin Center, to my relationship with Carl, and I'll close with just one observation. He and I went to Moscow together one year, and uh, we met with uh, all the leadership, but we also took time to meet with um, uh, Shur uh, not Sharansky, but uh, the, the great physicist uh, in, in, in Russia at that time. And we knew that the KGB was following us. And Carl said, I don't care, we're going up to a visit, we're gonna give these books uh, to him and we know the KGB is gonna take them right out. But he said, we need to get information to him at this particular time so he can absorb it. And that's Carl Levin. Uh, he wasn't concerned about the KGB. He wasn't concerned about what they would do after us. He wanted to make the point that we were going to deliver information to a highly respected uh, scientist. So uh, that's Carl Levin. Um, I, I, I'm just uh, proud that you would invite me to share this with Norm and Claire uh, to talk about uh, a little bit about Carl, not enough about him, but about our service in Congress. And I'm grateful for that. Well, we're grateful to all three of you for your kind words and for your wise counsel. Uh, I'm sorry we didn't have more time to get to some of the questions from the audience. There were just a whole variety of very interesting questions. Maybe we'll try to follow up on them some other way. But what I take from this panel is that oversight is powerful. When I look at your careers, when I look at the work that you did, the legislation you got passed, what I read from that is that oversight is a powerful but not easy tool. And I think hearing about the special responsibilities that Congress has in fact finding uh, just shows me even more how important it is that Congress engage in bipartisan fact-based oversight. Uh, and I think what I also took from this is that we need to have our voters think about fact finding when they choose their leaders, that they need to elect individuals who respect the facts and wanna work from the facts. So I'm going to end it there and thank you so much for your time, for your advice, for your wise counsel. Thank you so much and goodbye to all of our viewers as well. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye.